Department of Scholars Day. I'm uh, Dr. Banerjee, and I'm the Associate Director of the Arts Program. I am delighted today to introduce to you two of our uh, honors thesis projects. The first student we have in our honors program is from the History Department, who has been working with Dr. Davila um, on her honors thesis, and she finished it. And the title of the thesis is Comparing Parents. And Ottoman harem organization. Uh, what we're going to do is have her finish her presentation, and you will have about 10 minutes for questions uh, from her. So, go for it. Good morning. My name is Linda Weber, and I'm presenting my honor senior thesis, which is entitled Comparing Harems Abbasid and Ottoman Harem Organization. I'd like to start off with a little anecdote. The Book of Songs stated one anecdote that dealt with the poet and singer Ibrahim al Masawi and his contact with the Abbasid Caliph's harem. In Hugh Kennedy's version of the story, one day the Caliph Harun told the poet he intended to spend the morning with his harem and the evening drinking with the men. The poet was to keep himself in readiness, not seeing anyone or drinking anything, or he be, would be punished by death. The poet followed these requirements the caliph had stated until he came upon some women who coaxed him into a basket that lifted him into the palace. Once in the palace, the, po the poet came upon a room filled with slave girls and other women. The poet spent a week with these girls and, missing his and missed his summons with the caliph. The poet convinced the caliph through storytelling of the amazing place he had been the whole time and offered to take the caliph there. When the time came, Ibrahim and Harun set out together in disguise. However, Ibrahim later said that he received a message from God. He, told, he had been told to keep the girls away and hidden and not come out until he said so. The caliph warned Ibrahim as well not to call him by his title. But after drinking too much, Ibrahim slipped up and addressed him as, O commander of the faithful. The girls scattered when they heard the man with Ibrahim was the caliph. Harun turned to the poet and said, you have escaped from a terrible fate. If one of them had shown themselves to you, I would have cut your head off. This is just one example of the important sanctity and forbidden space that is the harem. My thesis argues that although both groups differ in ethnicity, the Abbasids being Arab and the Ottomans being Turks, the established idea of the harem through Islamic history creates a historical continuity with the economic, social, and political organization of the Abbasid and Ottoman harems. A few points of interest for this today are what is a harem, the relevancy of primary sources in historical research, the economic, social, and political organizations of the Abbasid and Ottoman harems, and what stayed the same between the two over the large period of time that they existed. What is a harem? A harem is a private and separate residence where women live. According to the historian Nadia Maria al Sheikh, a harem is a sanctuary or a sacred precinct. By implication, it is a space to which general access is forbidden or controlled. Furthermore, a harem is the private residence or apartments in which women lived, resided in. This space is also restricted to only male family relatives. Furthermore, within Islamic society, Having a harem served as a sign of status. The larger your harem, the higher your family status would be. Now, who are the Abbasids and the Ottomans? The Abbasid Caliphate lasted from 750 CE to 1258 CE. Its capital was located in Baghdad, which is in Iraq, and, it was a, and its ethnicity was Arab for the ruling family. On the map on your left, you can see the extent of the Abbasid, the Abbasid Caliphate. And to your left, you can see a map of the Ottoman, harem, Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire's ruling family was Turkish. Their capital was located in Constantinople, or later named Istanbul. And it lasted from 1299 CE to just shortly after World War I in 1923. The relevancy of primary sources in historical research is very important. And doing this research in particular, I came across several problems. First and foremost, the Abbasid history is passed down through an oral tradition, which means it's not written down and it's spoken from word of mouth, so on and so forth. 
However, the later Abbasid histories were recorded by historians such as Al-Tabari, who died in 923, which are the historiographies of the early Abbasid Empire, such as this, the case that I used, the early Abbasid Empire. For the Ottoman Empire, I also saw trouble with the bias of the European travel accounts. Firstly, most of the European travelers were male, and they would describe the female sanctum of the harem. They were not allowed within the harem because they were not related to the women, so that hindered their descriptions. But there are several travel accounts from French princesses and a woman from, the English who, from England whose husband was the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Her name was Larry Ma Lady Mary Wortley Montague, and her travel accounts to her sister and other women of the English court depict the inner sanctum of the harem. There still exists bias with these accounts, though, because she is a European woman and the Ottoman women have a different culture. Now, the social organization of the Abbasid harem is like an intricate social web. These women interact with each other each day, and some of them don't like each other, and some do. The first and highest role is the queen mother. The queen mother is usually the head of the social hierarchy and is the mother of the caliph. And basically, she runs all social aspects of the harem. Beneath her is an umwalda, or a mother of a child of the caliph. They devote their lives to bettering those of their children and making sure they have the best life possible, which is to become, if the princess would be married off to someone else, or that their sons would become the caliph. Underneath those women are the concubines and female slaves who entertain the caliph. They would entertain the caliph through singing, dancing, poetry readings, and of course, sexual activities. Um, these women would become the favorites of the caliphs and would eventually become a mother of a child or even the queen mother. And the last people who resided within the caliph's harem was his other family members, usually his grandmothers, his aunts, his nieces, his younger nephews, sons, and daughters. The social organization of the Ottoman harem, however, differs. For starters, the role of the queen mother is referred to as the Veil de Sultan, who, is, who has all the same roles as the queen mother of the Abbasid harem. She controls the social and political aspects of the Ottoman harem, and she usually determines who comes, who goes, when the sultan can see his women or when he can't. She was in control of those things. Also, the mother of a sultan's child was the next highest role. After you gave birth to one son, your life immediately became devoted to that of your child's. You would help them prepare for their political careers and possible ascension to the throne. The concubines and female slaves played similar roles to that of the Abbasid harem. They would entertain their sultan, they would read poetry, they would dance and sing for people and guests, and they would be entertainers. The sultan's family also lived within his harem. The economic organization of the Abbasid harem can be described in two branches, a social branch, which involves the role of the queen mother, and an administrative branch, which involves the role of the kaharmana, who is a stewardess of the harem. The, as stewardess of the harem, she held the purse and paid for all the goods and services needed to run a good and extravagant harem. She would pay female attendants, she would make sure the eunuchs were doing their jobs, she would make sure all the luxurious needs for these women were met and, their f and paid for food and whatnot. The queen mother, however, had a different role. Her role was based in charity and religious practice and per her personal wealth. Each year, the queen mother would make, a make the procession to Mecca, or, which is known as the Hajj, and while going, she would donate large amounts of her personal wealth to public works projects such as building fountains and lodgings for the other pilgrims. She would also donate her personal wealth to the caliph in times of war when the treasury was low. The economic organization of the Ottoman harem differed, but not by much. The Veil de Sultan had the same roles as the Kahramana and the Queen Mother. She would pay for the comings and goings of the harem and would also take part in charity and had a vast material wealth. The charities were the same. They would go on the Hajj and they would put money in the procession and donate to the cause. Material wealth, however, differed. 
the Abbasid queens had a lot of money, but the, the, the Ottoman queens had material things like jewelry the size of, their earrings were the size of pears in one description. They wore emeralds around their neck from head to toe. They were drapes and satins and silks and all the finest finery you can think of. They had it on. They also had many luxury items such as rugs, carpets, cushions, curtains, inner gardens, fountains, the finest china and silks you can think, in, think of. And of course, they owned many slaves and eunuchs. The importance of the black eunuchs for the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Empire is that during the 1700s, the English ended the slave trade, which made it very hard to come by these slaves. But throughout the 1700s and 1800s, the Ottomans were able to attain them through gifts. Lastly, the political organization of the Abbasid harem can also be broken up into two branches, that of the queen mother and that of the kahramana. The queen mother's power basically came from her son. If her son became the caliph, she had all the political control she would need. But if he did not, she was not going to go out of the harem. She would stay there and do not make any personal relationships with any of the court officials. One example of this is the queen mother, Kaiseron, who was the mother of Harun al-Rashid, who was the caliph that was the gold of the golden age of the Abbasid. Her power was all from her son, and when she died, her son kind of revoked everything that occurred. But he let his mother do what she wanted when she was alive. The role of the Kahramana as stewardess of the harem provided her access to and from the harem, which was not allowed to women at this time. They usually had to remain within the harem and their personal residence. This woman was able to build personal relationships and political relationships with court officials, the caliph, people like the Grand Vizier, and would do them favors and whatnot. The political organization of the Ottoman harem is basically the Kahraman and the Queen Mother all rolled up into one. The Velde Sultan worked within the inner and outer politics of the harem. Within the inner politics, as mentioned before, she had control of who came, who went into the harem, when the Sultan could see his wives, when he could see his concubines. But she also formed her son's harem as well. She picked the women he was going to marry, who his concubines would be, who his entertainers would be. She was in complete control of that. For the outer politics of the harem, the relationships with politicians that existed for the Kahramana also existed for the Velde Sultan. She had access to the outer politics of the harem through her son as well, and was able to build personal relationships with many politicians and court officials. And an important thing to note is when her son was not able to be sultan if he was too young, she would act as the regent and control the entire empire. So what has stayed the same through these two harems? Both harems socially see the same similarities between the role of the queen mother, the importance of motherhood, and the progression from a concubine or female slave to the favorite of the caliph or sultan. In both harems, women progressed socially based on motherhood and whether the sultan or caliph enjoyed them. A woman's whole social experience after having a son revolved around progressing their political and social careers to progress to help them ascend to the throne. And this progressed women socially and politically in the harem as well. The economic organization of both harems relied mainly on the charitable wealth of the queen mothers and other high women within the harem and their material wealth. Vast wealth, vast amounts of money and jewelry and whatnot was put into these women's harems and they lived very comfortable lives within them. The political organization, the number one thing that remained the same was that the queen mothers or the Velde Sultan's power came from their son. Without their sons, they wouldn't have any power at all and that is the most important continuity between the Abbasid and the Ottoman harems. Thank you. The main point of this thesis was to create a comparative analysis 
between the Abbasid and Ottoman harem to prove if there was any historical continuity between the two because the ethnicities are so different, but they have a, they have a common bond of Islam between the two. I wanted to see what remained the same and what changed. And I, ar I argue that majority of it stayed the same. Carrie Keenahan, and as she said, uh, my thesis topic was the bullying epidemic causes consequences, preventions, and interventions. So I'm going to talk about all of those. Just an introduction, since I'm sure everybody knows that bullying has grown greatly over the past few years. Just some statistics that support how much it's grown and. 1980, Olwes, who was kind of the pioneer of bullying research, did a study and found that 15% of students between age 8 to 16 were involved in bullying. 9% of those were victims, 6 to 7% were bullies. In 2001, he redid the study and found that the number of victimized students increased by 50%, and the number of students acting as bullies increased by 65%. So there's different types of victimization. Probably both of these you know, but direct bullying is physical acts directed towards peers, like hitting, shoving, punching, kicking. It's seen more in boys. And then indirect bullying is verbal and psychological. Verbal is more name calling and spreading rumors. Psychological is aiming to socially ostracize an individual, damage their reputation and damage relationships, which is seen more in girls. And there's also cyberbullying, which has definitely grown over the years. And this is inflicting psychological, emotional, and relational pain through harassment, intimidation, and threats used through technology, which allows the bullies to remain virtually anonymous. And it decreases their worries and fears of getting caught. It's a lot easier to be cruel and malicious through technology when you're not face to face with somebody. So the warning signs of bullying is increased violence, both physical and verbal fights. They are likely to refuse to accept responsibility for their actions, quick to blame others, and tend to feel empowerment and competitiveness to be superior. The behaviors that are seen in bullies are called externalizing behaviors, which are defined as a grouping of behavior problems manifested in children's outward behavior and reflect the child negatively acting on the external environment. So characteristics of this would be being disruptive, hyperactive, aggressiveness, delinquency, self-destruction, impulsiveness, physical <coughs> strength, difficulty paying attention. It's different for males and females. Males usually, as I said before, are more involved in physical or direct bullying. They'll be more disruptive, more physical strength is seen in them, and more difficulty concentrating. Whereas females are more indirect aggression, rudeness, talkative, gossiping, using vulgar language. So when these behaviors develop, they develop a sense of empowerment, which leads to increased self-confidence and allows them to become a leader and achieve high social status and 
whatever environment they're in, whether it's school environment. But oftentimes, despite their newfound popularity, they feel that they're still treated unfairly at school. They'll blame peer difficulties on hostile intentions of others instead of their own behavior and their own aggressive qualities. And with the aggression, there's two types, proactive and reactive. Both are seen in bullies, but proactive is more common. This is prearranged, carefully planned out. They know what they're gonna do. They disregard society's rules and they behave in a way that benefits themselves. Very manipulative. Reactive, on the other hand, is more impulsive and thoughtless and it's a quick response to being provoked. And it's inversely related to stress immunity, meaning that they have more anxiety than others would in the same situation, which causes them to respond in a risky, aggressive behavior. And then they blame someone else besides themselves for this impulsive, aggressive response. Victims, on the other hand, experience the opposite behaviors, internalizing behaviors. These are defined as problems that more essentially affect the child's internal psychological environment rather than the external world. So characteristics of this would be reclusiveness, being withdrawn, inhibited, depressed, poor communication skills, poor problem solving skills, and hedonia, which is an inability to feel pleasure. And self-blame is, blame, they blame themselves for the bullying, they believe there's nothing that can be done about it. So what causes a bully to become a bully? One theory is the biosocial interaction model, which suggests an interplay between biological and social factors experienced during pregnancy that influence a child and his or her behavioral characteristics that develop. So the biological factors are the genetic and maternal factors that impede fetal growth and development. Examples of this are illness during pregnancy, smoking, drugs, and alcohol use, and any birth complications, really. And this can affect a child's cognitive ability, and that can likely predispose a child to developing the externalizing behavioral problems. And social factors would be poverty, psychosocial stress, negative attitudes towards the pregnancy, or even teen pregnancy, and alcohol and drug abuse again. And the interaction between these factors in combination with poor parenting, maternal rejection, and or social adversity can predispose the child to developing externalizing behaviors. Domestic and parental violence also increases the child's risk of developing bullying tendencies, often because the imbalance of power and aggression in the family encourages the child to dominate others because that's how their household is operated. So, Bullies are almost two times more likely to be exposed to domestic violence than their peers. They're 3.5 times more likely to be involved in physical aggression at school and twice as likely to be involved in indirect aggression. Another theory is Bandura's social learning theory. This suggests that a cycle of violence is created as children observe and witness violent behavior among their parents. Being treated with aggression becomes a learned behavior and then they often replicate aggression to handle situations. So an example is if parents use direct forms of victim victimization sorry, against each other, the child is more likely to partake in forms of direct bullying. Same goes for indirect bullying. Child maltreatment, corporal punishment, corporal punishment being beating, spanking. It's a constant debate between whether spanking is a good thing or a bad thing, but this study showed that more frequent use of corporal punishment is strongly related to maternal parenting risk, which is defined as psychological and physiological maltreatment of the child, neglect, intimate partner violence, depression, and alcohol and substance abuse. So this study found that greater than two instances of corporal punishment a month when the child is three years old increase the child's likelihood to be aggressive at age five by almost 50%. Mental health of bullies also can affect them if they already have a psychological disorder. There's a few different ones. Antisocial personality disorder can predispose somebody to becoming a bully. They are, characteristics of this are they are unconcerned with others' feelings, disregard social norms, they're unable to feel guilt, and they blame others. Many bullies are identified with this by age 10, 
And the strongest predictor of this is violent home life, as I already talked about. And conduct disorder is basically a more aggressive form of antisocial personality disorder. It's more cruelty seen, more fighting. And it places individuals at a lot higher risk of growing up as a delinquent adolescent. Bipolar disorder is a cycling between periods of lows in depression and highs in mania. So norm bullying would be normally seen during the manic phase. And that's because they have a high rage response and interpersonal aggression. And they have a lot more energy during mania. And also paranoid personality disorder, which is exactly what it sounds like. Constantly paranoid, they misperceive others' behaviors as being provocative. And then they respond in an inappropriate, aggressive way. Additional disorders would be alcohol and substance abuse disorder major depressive disorder, attention deficit disorder, a lot of other personality disorders. So what would predispose the victim to being the victim? A lot of these are the same thing as what would cause somebody to become a bully. It's just kind of twisted in the opposite way. So child maltreatment again, this influences the victim more. It, physical and sexual abuse increases vulnerability to peer victimization in the school environment. Individuals who reported being bullied as children were more likely to also report sexual or physical abuse during childhood. And being abused causes them to be more submissive, which increases their likelihood to become a target of bullying. So for the bully, child maltreatment caused them to be a bully because they kind of learned that it be, aggression is the correct way to handle a situation, whereas for the victim, it causes them to be more submissive. And interparental violence, again, this leads to maladjustment, lowers self-esteem, causes fear. It reduces the child's capacity of being assertive when they're victimized, which increases their susceptibility to being victimized. And again, for the bully, this might have caused them to be a bully because they learned that that's an appropriate way of handling a situation, whereas here, it causes somebody to be a victim because it creates the fear in them and doesn't allow them to be assertive. So the effects of bullying, oftentimes people only think about how does this affect the victim. They don't think about how this affects the bully. But I'm going to talk about both. So there's a lot of mental health implications, again, that might result from the bully's behavior rather than cause the bully's behavior. Some of them are the same, again. There's substance abuse disorder, depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, antisocial personality disorder, and psychopathy. Psychopathy is just a very much more extreme version of antisocial behavior. But criminal involvement is the main effect of bullies. Um, they are approximately two times more likely to commit crimes. In this particular study, it was found that 60% of bullies between sixth and ninth grade were convicted of a crime at least one time by the time they were 24 years old. And 40% of bullies in the same age group received over three convictions. And in a different study, it was found that a number of convictions for an average bully was more than four times higher than that of a non-bully. And the odds of being convicted of a violent crime were six to eight times higher for bullies than non-bullies. So this is just a chart. that The black line is bullies. And this is for criminal involvement. So you can see that they're consistently higher than all the other groups, which are non-bullies victims and bully victims and how it affects the victims. Also mental health implications, mainly depression, poor self-esteem, diminished self-regard, difficulty with re relationships, and even eating disorders. There's a lot of school issues seen, mainly absenteeism, which is highly related to depression, and mainly because they fear being bullied and harassed, so they don't want to go to school. And that tends to cause a deterioration in academic performance grades drop, and suicidal ideation, which is related to depression and impaired problem solving. It was found in a study from 2011 that adults who reported being bullied in their childhood were greater than two times as likely as non-bullies to attempt suicide, and individuals bullied between age 6 to 11 were three times as likely to attempt suicide between age 19 and 20. So what can be done about the problem is the main question. 
The Always Bullying Prevention Program was the first comprehensive school-wide intervention that was implemented on a large scale. This targets multiple systems. It created school-wide anti-bullying policies, trained teachers how to properly address incidences that precipitated bullying, and offered informational workshops for parents. He always found by implementing this, it decreased bullying by 50%, and students also reported an increased satisfaction with social life. So this whole school approach is based off the assumption that bullying is a systemic social problem and the culture of the school must be altered. There's six components that go into it. The first calls for strong leadership in the school, the strong principal needs organizational support and adequate resources for the school. The second is changing the overall culture to discourage bullying as a whole. The third is there needs to be clear rules and defined punitive strategies and disciplinary sanctions, and there needs to be consistency in the rules and the sanctions. Fourth, raising awareness about the issue through education, not just to students, but to parents, teachers, administration, the community, everyone. Fifth is a safe school environment with needs to be supervised. And lastly is school family community partnerships. This could be engaging parents in activities as well to decrease bullying. The teachers, staff, and administration's role specifically, they need to be trained about strategies for preventing peer harassment and they need to respond to each and every bullying incident in a consistent manner and that'll show that the actions won't be tolerated and it also supports the victim and by making them feel less powerless. And they can use these witness bullying incidents as teachable moments and also teach life skills to decrease violence and delinquency. Overall, they need to be a role model for the students. The student's role could be in conflict resolution and they can be peer mediators. This will help promote pro-social behaviors and skills and promote communication and problem solving strategies. Oftentimes, students connect better with people their own age. They feel that their fellow students understand their problem better than an adult might. And they also can help decide upon rules. If students are helping to form the rules, they're more likely to follow the rules. The parents' role is also important. They should receive information about all of the school policies, as well as be involved in their child's life, which will help enrich the child's social development, promote better communication, and decrease levels of violence and conduct issues. The school nurses role, they can be an open ally to students for support and help prevent self-harm and suicide. In order to do so, they need to be aware of the warning signs which would be change in eating and sleeping habits, depression, suicidal ideation, and social withdrawal. They also can advocate and promote school programs on respect, safety, and anti-bullying, and overall create a safe environment in the school. In addition to the whole school approach where you're looking at everything, there's targeted interventions for just the bully and just the victim. So for targeting the bully, you can teach strategies to help handle peer conflict and teach them how to more accurately infer others' intentions. So this could speak to like the paranoid person who doesn't understand that what somebody is doing is accidental, not always intended. And for targeting the victim, can help them alter their maladaptive and dysfunctional thoughts related to the causes of their troubles, which is kind of similar to cognitive behavioral therapy. And you can teach coping strategies, problem solving, approaches to stress. And lastly, in addition to all the school approaches, there's been a lot of legislative actions in the recent years. Federally, there's been committees formed, such as the Federal Partner Steering Committee on Bullying, conferences held, such as the Bullying Prevention Summit, and campaigns, such as Stop Bullying Now, which is a national media campaign focusing on individuals aged 9 to 13. And it raises awareness. It has an interactive website to help with this. It supports research and it identifies appropriate preventative strategies and interventions, many of which are what I've talked about. New York State specifically has anti-bullying laws and policies. Not all states have both. 
We have 11 laws, 10 are education laws, one the penal law. They cover bullying, harassment, discrimination, and cyberbullying. And the penal law defines bullying as aggravated harassment in the second degree and is actually considered a class A misdemeanor. There's also the Dignity for All Students Act, which became effective in July 2012, and it amended the state education law. It combats bias-based bullying, harassment, and discrimination in public schools, and it protects all public elementary and secondary schools. It requires there to be at least one staff member in each school to handle all bullying incidences occurring on school property. This includes a school bus and school-sponsored events. And it requires all incidences of bullying or bias-based harassment to be reported to the New York State Department of Education. Well, this is a great act, it probably should be expanded to not just cover elementary and secondary schools, but to cover all public schools. So overall, bullying is definitely an issue that's growing. And I have a video to show that kind of like sums up a lot of what I said. It focuses on suicide mainly, but the main point is I feel like a lot of times you don't hear about bullying until something happens or you, it's on the news once somebody kills themselves. And it's something that needs to be thought about before a problem happens. So I don't know how loud the volume is going to be. I hope it's not really loud.
sorry to end that on a depressing note, but <laughs> you just tend to not hear about it till stuff like that happens. I feel like it would definitely help with cyberbullying if the parents were more involved in knowing what their child is doing on the media and internet, I mean. schools need to be more involved, which is easier said than done, but yeah. What were some of the specific strategies teachers were taught during the whole school program? Um, I don't remember the specifics, but it was more like being aware of the warning signs and how to respond to it and making sure you do respond to everything and not just brush it off, which I think is what happens a lot of the time. They, they teachers don't want to get involved because, I mean, they don't want to get hurt or anything. So it's teaching them what they need to do. But not only parents need to take a stand, teachers do too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it needs to start. Yeah, and administration, everyone. 